it's 6 p.m. according to uh, my, my, my uh, clock. And um, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, we continue our arbitration kitchen with arbitration stars from around the globe who are preparing their favorite dishes and share their secrets uh, in preparing the dishes, but also uh, we call it arbitration kitchen because they're revealing non, or not only their secrets with regard to cooking, but also their secrets related to arbitration, how they cook arbitration in a sense. Um, tonight we will uh, cook Dutch herring. It's a combination of something which is very Dutch and something which we believe very Russian. Uh, it's Dutch herring in Russian full court uh, with Evgenia Goryacheva, who is senior legal counsel at uh, PCA in Hague. Good evening, uh, Evgenia. Uh, good evening, Vladimir. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll show the list of ingredients to our participants, uh, so they'll be ready uh, if they want to cook uh, with us online. This is uh, how this wonderful dish will look tonight after we prepare it online. Um, this is a list of ingredients and it's pretty simple, it's uh, available everywhere. The herring, I believe, uh, the Dutch herring is not different than Swedish herring or uh, Norwegian herring or Russian herring. Uh, but uh, uh, Evgenia, tell us why you decided uh, to make this dish. Uh, well, um, as you said, I think it's the perfect union um, of uh, Dutch and Russian cuisine, which for me is particularly appropriate because I am from Russia, but I now live in, in the Netherlands. Um, and herring is really a staple of Dutch cuisine. And I mean, I'll show you the, the Dutch herring and you can judge if it's different from any other herring. It's smaller usually. This is the fresh herring. Um, and it has the amazing quality that you can usually buy it um, already clean um, and without any of the bones. So that makes the cooking much easier. Um, and uh, the thing is, um, where I work at the PCA, we have people coming in from all over the world and they come in and they learn about, oh, the very famous Dutch herring, which the Dutch tend to eat essentially on its own. They, they just take that piece that I showed you and uh, so are willing to, uh, you know, swallow it whole like this. And uh, many, of, many people who are not used to herring find that um, a bit daunting as a prospect. And I've taken to introducing them and making it more palatable for them by making this Russian dish, which has all these very uh, innocuous ingredients, the potatoes, the carrots, the egg, um, and all of that doused with a lot of mayo. And that makes it a lot easier to uh, become acquainted with herring. So it works pretty well uh, as an introductory dish um, for my colleague. Yeah, it's very interesting because the herring under, um, under full court is considered in Russia a very traditional dish. I don't know how it's in your family, but in our family, for example, every major event, you have to prepare this wonderful dish because it's tasty. Uh, I can't say that it's healthy, but it, 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 it's very nice uh, and everyone likes it. Uh, and I tried to find on the internet the history uh, of this particular dish, and I found that uh, it first mentioned uh, in Norwegian uh, cooking book in 19th century, in English cooking book. Interesting, in an English cooking book, it was called uh, Swedish uh, salad or something like that. Uh, but I found a very interesting story <clears throat> that uh, this re real uh, herring and the Russian full court was invented after the revolution in Russia in 1918. Uh, and one smart guy decided to make a dish which will unite uh, the peasants and the, the workers at the factories. Uh, and he said, well, herring is a typical food for workers at, uh, at factories. Uh, potatoes and beet and, uh, and um, eggs is typical for peasants. So it's like use a union of workers and peasants. And mayonnaise, because it's French mayonnaise, uh, it's a symbol of French Revolution. And it's which you put on the top 
uh, and it's red. It's a symbol of red flag, which was symbol of Soviet, Soviet Russia. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's it's, it's a very nice story. But tell us how you cook it, what you do. Okay, well, so as the instruction said, every the beets, the carrots, the potatoes, all had to be pre-boiled. Alternatively, for those people who don't like boiling them very much, you can bake the potatoes and the carrots. Um, and I had the head start, so I've already um, either cut or diced or uh, grated all of the ingredients. So you see, I essentially grated the potatoes and the carrots. And oh, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, my first question, for how long you need to boil it? The potatoes, is it normal boiling process, 10, 15 minutes, whatever? Um, well, I boil the potatoes uh, without taking the skin off. Um, I would say until they are ready. <laughs> I have no idea. I would take a fork and stick it into my potato and check um, okay. uh, the 20 minute mark. Um, so if it's soft, then it's ready. The same for carrots? Yeah. I mean, if you know how to boil a potato in order to eat it, that would do it. Okay, so the boiling process is not materially different from any other boiling uh, process of potatoes or beets, right? No, that's the beauty of it. It's very, very simple. Okay, and then you take skin off when you boil it? After, after it's boiled? After boiling it, I take the skin off, yeah. And then you cut in small pieces? Yeah, you, well, you can dice it or you can grate it. I grated it, but, but that's just... Mm -hmm. Person. Okay, so what you have um, in this um, uh, table show us, so you have potatoes, you have carrot, beet, and uh, what else? Okay, so here I Eggs. have egg. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and I have onion, and I have, of course, the uh, herring, which I'll show you. Yeah. Um, well, we got have herring. Have is it fresh herring, or is it salted herring, or is it pickled herring? Well, it's lightly brined, but it's what in the Netherlands they call fresh herring, essentially. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, it just needs to be cut into small pieces, as you see. Right? But uh, do you take bones out uh, from fish? You ought to, but that is the beauty of making this dish in the Netherlands, where they sell their herring already cleaned. So I'll show you, I'll make one, uh, just to, to be clear. But there's not much to show, uh, because this is, this, this is how it was sold to me. It's just, it has a tail, which I'm holding it by, but it's, uh, it doesn't have any bones already. It's been oh, so it's, it's, it's like... Uh... Lazy dish, uh, because in Russia normally have herring with bones, and it takes a lot of time to take bones out. Exactly, that explains why I particularly like making it in this country. Uh, so you just take, I only need to take off the tail, and then um, yeah, cut the cut it, and that's it. It's already been cleaned. I mean, honestly, I've lived here now for eight years, so I suppose I've almost forgotten how to clean the herring properly. Um, Okay, okay. Um, so uh, you, you cut the herring on small pieces, and what you do next? Um, well, I would suggest the idea of this dish is to essentially take all of these ingredients and put them in layers um, with mayonnaise in between or inside the ingredients. I'm going to suggest putting the mayonnaise in between because it's better for um, how the colors come out. Um, but the first thing I would do is that I would take the herring and I would um, mix it directly with the onion. I'm just going to go ahead. Ah, okay. So the herring is mixed with onion, uh, okay. onion also I cut on small pieces. Yep. So I just diced the onion in advance and I'm now mixing it. I mean, an alternative is to make a separate layer of the onion, but I prefer it this way. Mm -hmm. And then it's very, very simple, uh, and I will show you. It's just a question of layering the, uh, the ingredients. 
there are only two things that need to be thought about. One is in which order. And uh, from a quick look at the internet, I discovered that there is much debate raging on the question of uh, how, what is the order of the ingredients. Um, in particular, whether the bottom layer is supposed to be um, herring or uh, potato. The best well, I'm pretty sure from my personal experience, yeah. the two uh, Russian style herring comes the four is that the herring should be at the bottom. Right. So Even if you think about that's the name that's... of the dish, that it is herring under the full coat, it means that it should be under. Right. And apparently that's the classic, but there are um, many renegades out there who prefer the potato first, but I'll do it in the classical way. So it's just going to be a matter of layering um, first the herring, then the potato, a layer of mayonnaise, then the carrot, then the egg, the beet, and another layer of mayonnaise. Um, you can add more layers of mayonnaise if you like that. Um, the only other aspect that needs to be decided is um, in what shape we will do that. So you all saw the picture, the very nice picture, um, uh, where you can see the layers. Uh, to do that, it's best to have a baking shape without a bottom, so that you can put the layers in and take off the shape. Um, yeah, on the previous uh, slide, I think. Yeah, that one. So that's how you, so in order to get that, you would need that baking shape, which I don't have. And I have to say, frankly, that in my family, we tend to sacrifice the appearance of the dish uh, in favor of its taste. Uh, so we, we tend to just take, do the, the easy or lazy way, if you like, uh, just take a dish, uh, put the, all the layers in. Um, at the end, it will need to spend probably uh, at least three hours or even overnight in the fridge with the mayonnaise kind of soaking through. Um, and it will just look nice once you cut it out of the dish, but you won't have the, uh, the effect of all the colors. Or alternatively, if you have guests but, and you want it to look nice, but you don't have a, um, a baking shape like I discussed, Describe another alternative is what people do is that they take any kind of uh, glass recipient, so it could be this receptacle, sorry, or like a glass, and you can make individual portions. So just layer uh, the ingredients, and then you will have the nice colors, and you can serve them as individual portions um, for the sake of simplicity and so that we can uh, spend some time uh, talking not only about food. I will do it on the uh, simple way and just layer everything. Uh, okay, dish. okay. Yeah. And that's essentially it. start. Yeah. So you put first... The herring. Herring mixed with onions. So I just put in all the herring. Okay. I mean, I'm going to make one layer of each ingredient. Um, if you have a very deep dish, you can do um, multiple um, multiple layers, but I, I don't think that's strictly necessary. Um, so actually, I'm just going to try to do it. Some yeah, there we go. So that's the first layer. Um, the second layer would be potato. And I would suggest uh, putting some pepper and salt, which I will do. Um, um, you can pepper and salt each um, ingredient separately, but I think the only one that really needs it is the potato. Um, because the beets and the carrots are sweet, they don't necessarily require uh, any salt or pepper. I mean, it should be done to taste. Um, some people don't add any salt. Also, depending on the kind of mayonnaise you're using, mine is not very salty on its own. There we go. 
Um, potato is the ingredient in the greatest quantity, so I just uh, going to put it in. So we now have our second layer of potato. Actually, it's going to be easier with my hands because. Um, well, and essentially, so on and so forth. Um, each ingredient after the other. Okay, okay. I don't know if we really require the full demonstration, but um, after the potato, I would definitely add um, the mayo. Uh, so you're putting mayonnaise uh, on top of potatoes. My recollection of family recipe is that normally we don't put mayonnaise uh, between the layers. We just put it on the top and then allow the dish to stay overnight. Because if you freezer, it stays overnight and then mayonnaise and ne nevertheless goes to the levels and you uh, you have it with, with mayonnaise. Uh, and in addition to that, you are mixing it anyway when you take it to your table. Uh, but I understand that under your recipe, you're, you're putting some mayonnaise, you know, on, uh, on the top of, of potatoes. Yeah, so, I, I think it's, it's um, I mean, there are all sorts of variants. I like to have the mayonnaise with the potato, but um, th there are all sorts of options. For example, there are people who put in, say, green apples um, as the layer on top of the herring which oh. in my family was never done, but uh, I've seen it done elsewhere. So there are, there are options. It's like any recipe that, uh, you know, if you're going to make this for every single party, which Russians really do, um, you're going to want to vary every now and then. I think. Okay, while well, you're putting someone, what is next? The carrot, I believe. The carrot, okay. That's going to be the carrot. Um, okay, very nice. There we have the carrot. And then I would suggest the egg. Um, I, ha I make quite a bit of egg, a bit more than I re required for the recipe. I'm not going to put all of it actually. Um, Um, but that also is a question of personal taste. So there we go, there's the egg. And then the most, uh, well, I would say the second most important uh, layer, uh, the beets, which, and, um, you know, Because of course, there are so many Russian dishes that include beets. Uh, uh, well, of course, with beets, no doubt, but with herring, I believe herring became popular only in the 18th, 19th century because before that, uh, Russia did not have access to Baltic Sea. And herring is a typical fish for Baltic Sea. So without herring, uh, it, it was very difficult to be a national dish. Um, That's what, 300 years since there's been access to the Baltic Sea? Oh, yes, yeah. Enough, no? And then, you know, it became more popular, more and more popular herring because indeed this is a fish which could be easily salted um, uh, and you could keep it in barrels and eat uh, all the winter. So it must be popular, of course, in Russia. Okay, so you put, my, again, my nest at the top of... Yeah. Of the layer, the layer that you were talking about, that uh, it will, if I put this in in the fridge overnight, it will seep in. Um, okay, so it's a pretty simple, uh, simple dish. Uh, there are two important issues you have to remember with regard to it. One is, um, it's it's better to keep it before serving for, as Evgenia said, at least three hours. We normally in Russia do it overnight. So we keep it overnight in the freezer because it allows uh, my to go through the layers 
and it becomes more uh, it's more rich in in, in taste. Um, and the second issue, because uh, there's a lot of uh, useful uh, ingredients like potatoes, eggs, uh, and and, uh, and herring, uh, I'll tell you uh, that it uh, uh, goes very nicely with vodka. Yeah. Maybe another reason why it's popular in Russia, but again, uh, I'll give you uh, one important advice for those who are not from Russia. Uh, if you are going to drink it with vodka, don't forget to put vodka also into freezer. Because one of the common mistake is when people drink vodka, when it's hot or temperature, room temperature, while typically in Russia, we prefer to serve it very cold. So you, you have to prepare uh, the dish, put it in the freezer, uh, put uh, also vodka in the freezer. And uh, if you have a uh, next day party, uh, it will create a, a good atmosphere for, for the party, right? right? So hopefully if you have followed, then tomorrow, Saturday, you can have your party. Um, oh, yes, yeah. Can and you the the yes, on Saturday evening, you, you could have a party. Yes. I, I would put it in the fridge, not in the freezer. Yes, not in the freezer, you're right. So you're right, so in the fridge, but the vodka in the freezer. So yes, in the fridge, yes, you're right. Vodka in the freezer, yeah, you're right. Because I'm not sure what would happen if we put this in the freezer, it would probably... No, 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 no not, not in the freezer, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So that's essentially it. I just added some um, um, egg on top just by way of decoration because I didn't bother doing it in, in a nice transparent dish. I didn't have the right size of dish, but you can also just do this whole, have a transparent dish and then the layers will be visible through. Yeah, normally when you do in transparent dish, it, it looks uh, very nice because you see all the layers. And uh, it is even served like this, you see layers only when you carefully cut it by pieces when you are serving to different people. Yeah, exactly. I, my, my transparent dish was much too big for this, but um, if I were having guests, I might have gone out. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you for sharing this recipe with us. And uh, now I'd like to ask you some questions uh, about you and PCA as we normally do uh, with our kitchen. Um, um, I to allow myself to take a piece of paper. Yes, by the way, don't, don't forget uh, tomorrow when you cut some pieces of, of this dish, make a nice photo send to us because we are planning to publish Arbitration Kitchen Book by the end of the year. Uh, and to participants also as well, if you make it, please send us your photo, photos with various dishes. We will include it in our book, which will be published uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we will be called it uh, Arbitration Kitchen Book. Okay, well, I'll be sure to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Just move so that I can see better. There we go. Okay, now now you, you could see what we have on the screen. Yes. And this is my favorite photo uh, because I believe every Russian must have in his family album, uh, his family book, a photo with bear. Uh, because as we know, there are a lot of bears in Russia. And normally you, when you go on in Moscow on the street, you could have a bear uh, with balalaika, right? Uh, tell me, where did you meet this bear? Uh, well, this, this is exactly, this is in Moscow, um, which is where I, I spent my early childhood. Um, I believe this is in front of a circus actually, which you see in the background. Um, but although it may not be that usual to meet a bear in the center of Moscow, actually, um, in Russia elsewhere, one might meet a bear. I learned only recently that about 60% of the world's bears, which is to say something like 120,000 are in Russia. So it might be, not so, be that common um, in Moscow, but. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and then the next week we'll have arbitration kitchen with Ilya Nikifra, Ilya Nikifra, who is the managing partner of Russian law firm Yipam. And I was surprised to see that he also has in his family book uh, and I speak she was bear. Uh, right. I was done in St. Petersburg. So 
Um, mm -hmm. No surprise, while the foreigners think that, you know, uh, bears are everywhere in Russia, and this is a good confirmation of it. Exactly. Uh, uh, from this uh, childhood picture, we're jumping uh, to, uh, to to the age where I believe you graduated already, school. Uh, tell uh, tell yeah. us about this photo, where it is. What is nice? Um, yeah, well, as you see, this is essentially a photo of me uh, exhausted after having climbed a mountain. Um, and also probably exhausted uh, of my legal studies, because this is when I was studying law at McGill University in Montreal. And um, McGill has this approach, which they call uh, the trans-systemic approach. Essentially, it means that they teach both uh, common law and civil law at the same time, which can be pretty exhausting for the students. Um, and so my favorite getaway in those years was to drive down um, across the border from Canada to the US. And this is uh, in the Adirondack Mountains uh, in upstate New York. It's just about two and a half hours from Montreal, but uh, in the US, I would go there quite a bit to a camp and uh, yeah, hike, which is what you see. So you, you did it uh, every weekend or a couple times uh, per month? Uh, how often? Uh, uh, no, I would say more uh, a few times a year. I mean, you have to, um, yeah, take the whole weekend, have, hopefully not do it alone, find some friends or, uh, yeah, who are willing to do it. And also, there are only a few, there are not that many months of the year, you don't want to do it in the middle of winter. Although I've, I've done it in November, and camping was very, very cold, I have to say. Um, no. I didn't you know. go to mountain now when you're in the Netherlands because I'm afraid there's no mountain in Netherlands. Huh? Yes, exactly. I think that's why I picked this picture. I'm nostalgic because now that I live in this uh, flat country, uh, I mean, the Jacques Vachel song, Le Plat Pays, was about Belgium, but it's, it's the same here. Um, so I'm, I guess I miss the mountains and the, and the, and the ability to just uh, drive out from home and end up there. And indeed, there's another mountain. Um, uh, there's also, I mean, this, uh, this is a very nice mountain, where it is? This is Mount Fitzroy. It's on the border between Chile and Argentina. I'm standing on the Argentine side. Uh, this is when sometime between uh, my law studies and passing the bar, I, I had a little uh, interlude of uh, trying to do not law. And uh, I spent a few months um, in Chile, mostly uh, practicing Spanish. And uh, in particular, I was teaching English in a high school uh, in this very little town called Tocopilla, which is uh, in mining country on the, on the edge of the Atacama Desert. Uh, uh, the, the desert that um, Che Guevara crosses in his motorcycle diaries. So I spent some time there. Um, and of course, I visited the very, very beautiful region, uh, and I was attracted by it's, the mountains. Again, it's amazing you were born in Russia and believe in, uh, in Russia, you graduated the schools and you went to Canada. And then from Canada, you went to another continent, to Chile, where you are teaching English while English is not your mother tongue. This is amazing. Um, how you managed to do it? <laughs> I, I, I like languages, <laughs> which is why I wanted to learn more Spanish at the time, well, which was one of the big reasons that I, I was in Chile. Uh, although the Chilean Spanish is very particular and may not have been necessarily the best choice for a, uh, a beginner like me. But uh, yeah, that was some... Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so after spending some time in Chile, you were invited to PCA. Did you apply to PCA? How did you get there? Um, well, the PCA has a long-standing uh, program, I would say, where we uh, welcome one fellows for one year who are um, either recent graduates or young professionals. And this is sometimes done uh, under agreements with different universities. And so McGill University, where I had studied, is one of the uh, universities who has sent us fellows every year for over 10 years now. 
uh, and I was the fellow, one of the fellows in, in 2011, which is how I came for a year. And then, well, um, I guess uh, I stayed. Uh, is, is it your window around it in the photo? Uh, that's right. That's uh, my office for if any of okay. you uh, are interested in visiting. Um, that's where I am. This is very, very, very beautiful building. How old is it? It's, um, they finished building it in 1913. So a few years back, we, we celebrated its centenary. It was actually built uh, essentially to house uh, the permanent court of arbitration and a, uh, a library of international law, which is still there, the Peace Palace Library. Um, and then tell us who is on this photo because I could recognize Sarah. Uh, she yeah. is with uh, HKC, and we had Kitchen with her, I think, last month, where she mentions that she was working at PCA uh, mm -hmm. with you, Evgenia. And I'm happy that we found another photo where, again, uh, we see you and Sarah, but who are the other people? Right. Um, well, this is a photo of the tribunal and the PCA registry, being Sarah at the time and myself, um, in the in uh, one of the interstate arbitrations that I worked on, uh, the Arctic Sunrise arbitration between the Netherlands and Russia. Uh, this was a case um, that concerned the arrest of a Greenpeace ship that was flying the Dutch flag. It was arrested by Russia in its uh, exclusive economic zone. Greenpeace at the time was staging a protest against uh, oil exploration in the Arctic. And they, uh, what they tried to do was climb a Russian oil platform. And um, they were, uh, their ship was stopped and arrested and brought to Murmansk. Um, and the, the Netherlands requested that it be released uh, I thought this was a very good case to talk about today because, well, we're making a Dutch-Russian dish. And actually, um, while the tribunal rendered its decisions a few years ago, uh, just last year, the Netherlands and Russia issued a joint statement uh, where they agreed on the, on the amount that would be paid in relation to these events and where they set out a number of principles of international law of the sea uh, on which they agreed. And those principles very closely followed um, the decision on the merits of this tribunal that you see on this picture. So that was, um, I would say, in a sense, a happy ending to a case that took place a while back. Okay, very good. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, PCA. I sure. uh, found uh, very interesting statistics in the one of presentation of you or your colleagues uh, regarding interstate arbitrations. And while many people believe that uh, arbitration did not exist in uh, 19th century, but as we could see from this graphical chart, uh, in fact, there were a lot of arbitrations. Yes, the, that's in correct. Century. Yes. I mean, this chart essentially, so to take a step back, the PCA was created in 1899. So just at the end of that chart. And this chart really illustrates uh, the climate in which this occurred. Um, so what you can see essentially is that after the success of the Alabama arbitration in 1874, which is fairly famous, and that was a case between uh, the UK and the US, uh, then in the last decades of the 19th century, there was a boom in interstate arbitration uh, with the last column you see is the last decade, um, yeah. essentially. Um, okay. And um, this came, I mean, this showed that at the time there was a willingness of um, states to um, undertake arbitration to solve their disputes. And it also came at the same time as, um, I would say, as, at a time when interstate arbitration was becoming a favorite objective of the international peace movement, uh, which sought to substitute legal proceedings for war. So that was the climate at the end of the 19th century, just before uh, the PCA came into being. Right, and that's what, where this uh, leads us to. Um, well, you see uh, Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, of course. Um, he is 
and his advisors are the ones who invited other uh, states to convene for the first Hague Peace Conference in 1899. Uh, he had perhaps a more prosaic um, goal in mind than the international peace movement. Uh, he was probably thinking of uh, achieving a moratorium on the arms race that was raging at the time between the uh, uh, European powers. Um, he wasn't successful in that, but the uh, conference, and in the second picture, what you see is essentially that that's the conference. Uh, those are the meetings in 1899. It did lead to the creation of the PCA as a permanent institution um, that would assist states in resolving their disputes amicably uh, and in arbitration, uh, provided that there was consent to the specific arbitration. At the time, there was also a proposal to create a, a world court with compulsory jurisdiction, but that did not uh, pan out in those early years, and instead the PCA was created. So that's what you see here. Uh, uh, These are very interesting pictures because we're going to talk uh, about diversity later today, uh, but I notice here, I think uh, this was uh, almost the rule at that time, uh, that representatives of the states were only male representatives. There's no even one female representative of the state because at that period of time, yeah. uh, it was not quite popular. And I, I just recollect what happened with, um, with first Soviet government where we have female ministers uh, mm -hmm. Russian government, I think it was revolutionary in a sense that at that time indeed it was not uh, fashionable to include females in such kind of delegations. Uh, and as an example, uh, thank you very much for sharing this photo. Uh, this is, uh, I understand, the photo of, uh, of the Russian delegation, right? Yes, that's correct. That was the, the delegation of the then Russian Empire uh, to the uh -huh. first Hague Peace Conference. Uh, and uh, yes, you're very correct. All very male. Also, yeah, yeah they're yeah. all wearing it's very it's interesting like hats. From Hollywood movie, you cannot believe that the people just a little bit more than 100 years ago were wearing uh, such uh, strange, strange, uh, um, you know, coats and, uh, and hats and so on and so forth. Well, I'm sure at the time they were they were all very fashionable. I mean, oh, they're yeah. all dressed. Well, the same. I'm pretty sure that in 100 years people would look in, in, uh, on us and say, "Well, how funny uh, people were 100 years ago." Indeed. Let's come uh, to PCA statistics because what I found amazing, really amazing, the growth of PCA administered case cases in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. so the chart it started. Well, I'm sure that there were some cases before uh, that in 2000, year 2000, there were just five cases. In 2019, there were one, 199 cases. So this is mm -hmm. uh, 20 times uh, yeah. uh, in, in 20 years. How you are able to achieve it? Right. Um, well, first, I would, I think, take a step back a little bit before 1999. Um, and just say that although the PCA was initially created to deal with interstate disputes, its mandate was then opened up uh, to allow um, it to facilitate various kinds of dispute resolution that involves different combinations of parties, including states, but also uh, state entities, intergovernmental organizations, and private parties. So this happened in the 1930s, long before that, but it was a necessary step to uh, allow this growth. And uh, well, while I would like to say that it's really the tireless work <laughs> of the staff of the PCA, um, there are a number of concrete reasons, but I think those might be, I know you have another graph and I think that one is helpful to explain uh, the growth. I mean, this only shows the last 10 years, but it's helpful because it, um, divides the types of disputes. And so you see the blue at the bottom is the uh, investment arbitrations. And you can see that consistently in the past years, they've um, accounted for about 
60, 65% of the PCA's docket. So in one, in one very important way, um, the growth of the PCA's caseload has tracked the increasing popularity of uh, investment arbitrations. And in particular, the PCA administers uh, on a regular basis uh, in investment arbitrations that are conducted under the ancestral rules. So that's one aspect. Uh, then additionally, increasingly parties have been recognizing the PCA's experience in the field of contract-based arbitration involving states and state entities. So that's the second category, which is in orange. Um, and this area is continuing to grow uh, particularly given that some states have entrusted the PCA with roles in their model state contracts, in particular those that relate to natural resources and infrastructure projects. Uh, so just to give an example, in the past three years, government agencies in Argentina, in Brazil and in Mexico have published model contracts uh, concerning oil and gas exploration and exploitation, which all provide for a role for the PCA. So there's been a growth in these contract based cases. And then, um, which is here in gray, we have the interstate arbitrations, which is in the PCA's docket, a small uh, number or a small proportion of cases, but it's a consistent number. And in many ways, um, some of these cases have been very important and in terms of the time that they have required from the registry uh, are perhaps uh, more, um, more considerable than is suggested by their sheer number. And in particular, there have been cases under a variety of legal instruments, but especially under the United Nations Convention for the Law of the Sea. So the Arctic Sunrise Arbitration I mentioned earlier is one example. Um, under that convention arbitration is the default means of dispute resolution where parties have not agreed on a different forum. And uh, since the convention came into force in 94, um, so that's just the past 25 years, there have been 15 arbitrations of which the PCA has administered 14. So the, I think those are the main factors that explain uh, this growth in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, there's also a significant number of cases where PCA is acting as a pointing authority. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, and the first graph that you showed starts in 1976. Um, and the yeah. reason for that is that, um, yeah, yeah, this one, it starts in 76 because essentially the vast majority of the appointing authority requests are under the ancestral rules. Uh, and the first version was adopted, of course, in 76. Um, and essentially, the secretary general of the PCA can be called upon to either designate an appointing authority or to act directly as appointing authority to assist with the constitution of tribunals, to decide challenges, to review fees of tribunals. Um, and there's been, well, a growth since 76 and uh, a fairly constant number of cases in the last uh, 10 years, I would say. Yeah, which is a significant number of cases where PCA is acting as a point in authority. Well, it's also interesting to see what kind of services, uh, I believe, under the trial rules, PCA uh, could provide to the parties, right? Right. Well, the, so this is a it can be under the ancestral rules. It can also be under the PCA's own rules. We now have a, a couple of cases under those. Um, the so as I said, it, the two categories are essentially cases where the secretary general designates an appointing authority. And then that appointing authority uh, takes a role in assisting with the proceedings or the secretary general himself acts as appointing authority. And then he can assist with the constitution of tribunals. So appointing uh, a sole arbitrator, a presiding arbitrator, a second arbitrator into a tribunal of three um, deciding challenges to arbitrators, um, reviewing the fees that the tribunal, um, either, either the, the mechanism to, to calculate the fees that the tribunal proposes at the beginning of a case, or potentially uh, the final fees that they in indicate that they intend to charge to the parties. Um, and then there are a couple of other types. 
Okay, back to 2019 here, we, we, we have statistics for one year. Yes, that's correct. Well, that's um, essentially that. So this is uh, interstate arbitrations, right? Investor state arbitrations, investment arbitration cases. That's the yellow, yeah, that, that's the lion's share, the 63%. Uh, you know, we've got a question. Uh, what is your feeling with regard to the seat of arbitration? Uh, is the Hague normally also selected by the parties as a seat of arbitration, or you administer the cases with different seats? We administer cases uh, with any seats. Um, at the moment, it's, um, I would say, about a third of our cases, approximately, are uh, cases where that are seated in the Hague. But um, then there are cases that are seated just about anywhere else in the world, both that have their legal seat uh, and also where the proceedings are in actually held. So of course, we in cases that we administer, um, we give the parties in the tribunal access to the premises of the Peace Palace, which we saw earlier on um, at no cost. But we also have access to other premises uh, in different er parts of the world. And uh, we generally organize hearings just about anywhere. Um, <clears throat> and this chart also shows uh, the origin of the parties. And we see that uh, well, basically the parties are coming from all the, all, all the world. We have Western European, Asia Pacific, Africa, Eastern European, Latin America. Uh, so we, we cannot say that you know, PCA is concentrated on European cases because you have uh, cases from various continents, right? No, absolutely. So certainly as far as the users of the PCA go, that is the parties, um, they cover essentially the entire globe. I mean, you can see these are the UN regional groups and uh, it's a pretty even division between the groups. Uh, I thought for those uh, from the Russian Arbitration Association for whom this may be of interest, I also separately looked at the number of CIS cases we have uh, because yes. they fall between two groups here. And uh, that's also about 15% uh, of the current docket are um, like member states of the CIS. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it explains, I think, uh, uh, the policy of opening offices in various countries. Uh, from this chart, I could see that you have offices in Singapore, Mauritius, and Buenos Aires, correct? Yes, well, we always uh, like to show the Peace Palace uh, as this almost the emblem of the PCA. Uh, but of course, we now have these four, a total of four permanent offices uh, on uh, four different continents. Um, and what this chart also shows is that in addition to that, we have a policy of concluding host country agreements uh, with different states. Uh, which allow us to conduct proceedings on the same conditions that we are able to do so in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, also of uh, concluding cooperation agreements with arbitral institutions in different parts of the world. Um, so here you have uh, both our, uh, our partners who are the, with whom we have coast country agreements. Those are the little uh, pale blue stars and the institutions in different cities with whom we also have cooperation agreements. Uh, those are the blue dots. Uh, and, and so you have in Singapore, Mauritius and Buenos Aires, uh, do they do case management? So it's a full- Absolutely, yeah. There, um, um, there are, um, a permanent presence means that there usually will be um, one or more lawyers of the PCA who can handle um, proceedings. Uh, we've had, for example, we, I mean, we've had multiple, multiple hearings in Singapore where we're able to use uh, the premises of Maxwell Chambers. Uh, we've had a hearing in Mauritius um, and the Buenos Aires office uh, just opened last October, uh, but it's already seeing some activity. Um, and there too, we have, uh, um, very, very beautiful, actually, uh, hearing rooms that can maybe be made available at no costs to the parties. Um, 
so the, essentially it's no longer a, a European only operation yeah. yeah oh and that's yeah is this as I understand your team you're you're working for PC yeah well a small part of our team we're about a small part uh, of how many people are working for, for PC we are now in the International Bureau more than 60 people um, including both lawyers and non-lawyers um, this subgroup that you see is, as I said, we, we have um, every year uh, fellows who come in for a year. And this is uh, this year's group, um, or at least as it was uh, in December, I think when the picture was taken. Um, so we have people from all over. Just in this picture, we have uh, some people from Jordan, from China, from Korea, from Canada, from Spain, etc. Yes, uh, and I want, I, I promise you that I want to talk about diversity, and I think it's the right time to talk about diversity. Um, uh, we see here in this picture, I believe 15 people, and I see only three male. Uh, members of your group, all other members are female. And I believe that if you look into another people at PCA, the proportion would be the same. So majority of people, people working at PCA are female. And uh, I'll tell you because I, I asked the same question to other arbitration institutions. I see general trend that many people who are working for institutions are in essence female. Uh, if you look into Secretariat of Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, I believe they're almost all female. At ICC, there's a mix of female and male, but I believe that in many institutions, the majority of people working at Secretariat is, is female, which from one side we could say it's good, right? And from other side, what do you think? Is it not the right time to sign another pledge where institution will commit to hire more male uh, people uh, to work for them? Well, I don't... Um... Actually, I don't know if this picture is uh, really representative of the balance. I think we're fairly close to parity. Um, oh, yeah? Just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we, gen I mean, it's not the first hiring criterion, I would say. Uh, the first hiring criterion uh, has much more to do with ability and specific competence, uh, competences. But we do try to keep an overall parity, I would say. Uh, between male and female within the bureau, yeah. But but do you have statistics with regard to appointment of arbitrators, for example, uh, whether you appoint female uh, or male arbitrators, or, or you know on, on national diversity uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, well, I don't have a specific statistic with me now. Um, I would say there's largely a lot of diversity in terms of geographic diversity. That's, I would say, not an issue so much. Um, I think the male to female diversity is, is still an issue. I mean, we, for example, one, in, for many cases, um, for the appointment of sole arbitrators and presiding arbitrators, this is done through a list procedure where um, the PCA puts together a, um, a list of potential appointees, and um, the uh, tribunal yeah. in this uh, yeah. in yeah. this case uh, you mentioned before is yeah. male tribunal. So yeah. the um, well, I who are here were in case management team. They are not. That is a good, very good point. But um, it's one a point not entirely related to the PCA because. Under the UN Convention for the Law of the Sea, the, the PCA doesn't actually have a role uh, in the appointment of, uh, of the tribunal. So perhaps there is a, um, a comment to be made, but it, it, it's not about our practice. Um, and as I was saying, so for example, we put together um, lists uh, of arbitrators for the parties to choose. And um, we, we try always to include uh, female uh, candidates on those lists. Uh, but it, there is definitely, I think, still work to be done uh, in, in that field. Okay, Eugenia, okay, yeah. thank you very much for uh, for your recipe. Uh, and very interesting discussion about PCA. 
and the cases you are handling and uh, the tendencies uh, in resolving disputes. Um, uh, I cannot ask you uh, how PCA works these days at the time of pandemic. Are you working remotely or are you, are you, you are going, how often you go to the office? Uh, well, our, the Peace Palace is open, um, so, but we are, at least in the Netherlands, um, still under the recommendation of the government to work from home if possible. So um, when needed, we are able to go to the office, but we try still to work from home in order to keep with the recommendations of the government. Um, that said, for the past few months, we have moved a lot of our uh, hearings and meetings online. Um, because it's so mainly because the situation with traveling is uh, is quite difficult with parties and uh, council all across the world and uh, not having certainty as to the ability of everyone to travel. Um, we actually have, um, if uh, anyone is interested, uh, there was a recent um, hearing in the Renko versus Peru, uh, two parallel cases, which was also webcast on YouTube and um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but either as of now or shortly, there will be the videos of the entire hearing. So uh, for those who are interested uh, as, to see an example of a virtual hearing uh, with the PCA, um, that will be on our website. Oh, it will be interesting to see how it's technically organized because there are many hearings, of course, organized online and it will be um, interesting to see what PCA, how PCA does it. Uh, and uh, because uh, pandemic is still not over, we're asking yeah. our participants of our kitchen uh, to donate to World Health Organization um, whatever amount they can donate in order to overcome uh, the pandemic. Um, the interview uh, was taken by Vladimir Hvalei. Uh, Vladimir, thank you. Sorry, I'm interrupting yes. you, but I, I just want to take <laughs> Yes, don't I'm put an end to this. Baker Macken, the chairman of the board of the Russian mm -hmm. Association. And thank you very much, Evgenia, again, uh, for, for your CP. A very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm waiting for a picture of your dish because we want to include it into the book. And I promise you, you'll get a nice copy of the book with recipes from around the world, information from institutions from around the world uh, by Christmas time. So next year, if you want to cook something new, you know, with national uh, flavor, you'll get a lot of choices. Well, Vladimir, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to those who are following us. And uh, I'll make sure to, uh, to send you that picture. Okay, yeah. thank you very much to everyone um, and bye-bye.